Okay, hematologic and renal emergencies. I kind of gave you an overview of this just a few minutes ago. We're going to look at those two systems. We talked about the blood. The blood actually is its own organ system. It's a very important organ system. What does blood do? I'll give you an answer. What's blood do? <laughs> It, what, it clots, transports nutrients, transports nutrients like transport antibodies and oxygen, takes, removes waste products or transports waste products. It provides heat. Yeah, it keeps us warm as it circulates. Yeah, that's right. Did we miss anything? Let's see. Uh, removal waste products. Well, that's pretty good. This is stuff, you know, we've been over it, so I'm going to hit it kind of quickly. Uh, what are the solid parts of blood? Uh, red blood cells, red blood cells, cells, white blood cells, white blood cells platelets. platelets. Okay, good work. What are the liquid, uh, ah, the liquid plasma. parts? Plasma. plasma. Okay, <laughs> good for me. And many of your patients will take medications that may alter some of that chemistry. Uh, any idea what I'm talking about? Blood thinners. Yep, they may take blood thinners, most commonly. Okay, we're going to look at a few specific disorders related to uh, uh, hematology. Anemia is going to be a lower than normal number of red blood cells. And why is that a problem? You yep, you don't trans can't transfer, uh, can't move around as much oxygen. Acute anemia we see usually in the setting of an acute blood loss. So this is going to be a traumatic injury. Somebody's bleeding out all over, they're like sanguinating. And they're going to have acute anemia, right? Is that what we most commonly see? An acute anemia? Well, that's what we see, yeah. But you're also going to have patients that have chronic anemia. Uh, for patients, women that have excessive menstrual periods, in a normal menstrual period, you really don't use it, uh, lose that much blood that it's noticeable. But if, if it's an excessive thing, that could be a problem. A patient with a slow GI bleed, and those actually are quite common where patients have a, a slow uh, gastrointestinal bleed. Or if they have other diseases that affect the bone marrow. I have a sister-in-law that has a disease that affects the bone marrow. She has to go in about every six months and get uh, these transfusions, and they do all kinds of stuff. It's extremely uh, painful for her. But So you want to determine if their anemia is chronic or if it's, it's, it's acute. A particular form of anemia we want to talk about is sickle cell anemia. And if you see, uh, red blood cells typically have this little round shape with a little depression in the middle. They're kind of cute. You know, they look like little, you know, gummy bears or something. They look, you know, they squeeze through and they change shapes as they move sometimes. Uh, but this particular one is what they call the sickle cell. And they're abnormally shaped. And part of that abnormal shape, it causes them to, uh, they don't transfer oxygen well. They have a very short life. They die much quicker than a normal red blood cell. And because of their shape, they kind of get caught in places they, you know, that we don't want them to get caught. These little nice gummy little things move easily through the vascular system, whereas the, uh, the uh, sickle cells don't. They get caught sometimes. It's a genetic disorder, and we see it primarily in African, African Americans and then a Middle Eastern uh, descent uh, populations. It's, it's very common, and it said it's genetic, so it tends to run in families. You can see the shape, it's shaped like a sickle. I already said that, good for me. I have a little video I was gonna show you because it was really interesting. As I told you back when I went to paramedic school, we didn't even talk about sickle cell. Uh, now, how do we determine? Is this going to go? Something to go with this? No, the effects. Some of the effects. Yeah, but I was hoping that it would do it. <laughs> okay, what do I have to do? I can oh, copy this. You, uh, oh, that's not a link. No, you're going to have to open it up and then copy the, uh, the URL. From the right computer. now? Yeah, open it yeah, up like you just did. did. And then go to the top of the internet browser where you type this. So in that's the way. Uh, no, the effects. 
some of the effects of Some of the effects of sickle cell disease include anemia, pain, infection, jaundice, acute chest syndrome, pneumonia, organ damage, stroke, psychosocial issues, social, emotional, academic. When the sticky sickle cells become lodged in blood vessels, a number of problems can occur depending on the location of the blockage. Clogging of the spleen can prevent it from fighting off germs in the body, leading to increased risk of infections. This is why a fever is a medical emergency for a child with sickle cell disease. Pain as it relates to sickle cell disease is one of the most common complications that we see in patients who have sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. When you don't have oxygen, um, when you have a lack of oxygen uh, to the tissues, it causes tissue damage and sometimes tissue death, what we call tissue necrosis, which sends off um, signals that cause pain. And there are times where there can be chronic um, areas that have had repeated damage, um, so repeated insults of lack of oxygen to a particular tissue, which can cause more permanent damage or scarring. that tell you they're having this crisis and they're in a lot of pain and it's very difficult for you to determine that so you're going to treat them like they actually have that pain uh, but if they're having a true sickle cell, cell crisis it's extremely painful and it can be a very serious complication uh, it can destroy the spleen that's one of the areas that these uh, sickle shaped cells seem to accumulate in the spleen and it can be very damaging there. We call it a sickle cell crisis. Uh, when you think about all the places that these cells can accumulate where they can block tissue, then you really can have a problem just about anywhere. Acute uh, chest syndrome, I don't have that uh, written out here. Um, if, you, if they clog the heart, it's almost like a heart attack where they can have that priapism, uh, stroke, Sickle cell can, wherever they accumulate, can cause a huge problem for the patient. Treatment, high flow oxygen. If they've got a problem with their red blood cells, then they have a problem transporting oxygen, right? So high flow oxygen is going to be your best treatment, monitoring them for respiratory distress, and uh, also for hypoperfusion. Why is, how do they become hypoperfused? Blockage, but yeah, if they, they are not getting enough oxygen to the tissues, perfusion is going to be the distribution of oxygen and nutrients to the tissue and the removal of waste products. Well, if you're not getting oxygen to the tissues, then uh, they're going to be hypoperfused. You want to take them to a stroke center if you think it's a stroke, but otherwise they're going to go to the closest hospital. Uh, they're usually going to treat this with uh, fluids. They get their fluid level up. It may uh, allow movement of those sickle-shaped cells uh, away from a blocked area. So fluids, uh, oxygen, and then pain relief is the most common way they're going to treat this. One in 12 African Americans have a sickle cell trait. It doesn't always lead to complications. They may just be a carrier and it doesn't present itself. 
a lot of patients lead a normal life, but the, it's kind of cyclical. They'll have a, a crisis event where they have a bad time, and then other times they're, they're okay. Just kind of be on watch out for those. If you see articles about it, read about it, it's very interesting. Uh, but you will have patients over the years with sickle cell disease. Okay, we're done with the blood stuff. That was pretty quick. Cool. <laughs> there's so much more. I think there's a little bit more in your textbook, so make sure you read that. Uh, the renal system. This is going to be a, a large part of your patient population. I don't mean half, but a, a significant part of your patient population. We're going to be talking about the kidneys, the ureters, the urethra. What are, the, what are What's the ureters? Those are going to be the two tubes that drain the kidneys and uh, come into uh, the bladder here. And then the urethra is what removes it, the pathway out of the body. The kidneys also are responsible for filtering your blood and removing waste products. Extremely important job that they do. When we talk about perfusion, we talk about delivering oxygen and removing waste products. Well, it's your kidneys that do most of the filtering of that waste product and getting it out of the body. So if they're not working, it's like, it's like I had my grandchildren in town this weekend, and there's a couple of those people that are still in diapers. If you've ever had a, back, a backup of diapers in your garbage pail, you know what I'm talking about here. Imagine if nobody came around to take the garbage out. We would be pretty toxic in that place in a hurry, right? Same thing here. If we can't get somebody to pick up this garbage, you know, as the blood is being filtered in here, if it's not able to get out, if it's not able to be filtered, it just recirculates with the bad nasties in there. How quickly is your patient going to become toxic? Uh, really, really quick. It's never a good thing. So if the kidneys are not working, if they're not able to cleanse the blood, your patient's going to become toxic very quickly. One of the problems that you're going to see is an alteration in their acid-base balance. And that's not something we spend any time talking about in this class, but if you go on the program, we talk about it a lot. But the patient usually becomes very acidic with this backup of the toxins in there. And that's never good. The body, you know, operates in a very, very narrow uh, uh, acid-base balance. Your kidneys also maintain fluid balance. What are we talking about there? Sometimes you hold a lot of fluid, sometimes you don't. Uh, can you think of one electrolyte in particular that helps you hold fluid? Yes, sodium, potassium. That's going to help you hold fluid in there. So sometimes you may have patients that are taking, uh, if they're on blood pressure medication, they may be taking a diuretic, which helps move some of that fluid out. You don't see that so much with patients with kidney disease uh, because they have, th they never want to be overhydrated. So for instance, if you had a patient that had kidney disease and was having a crisis where they say they've not been to dialysis, uh, you don't want to overload them with a bunch of fluids. Remember in the uh, lab last week, we were looking at the, uh, the IVs and we talked about the different drip sets. What's a drip set where you would give a whole lot less fluid? the 60 or the micro drip. For a patient who had kidney disease, you want to be sure that you used a micro drip because you don't want to overload them with fluids because their kidneys can't handle it. So usually these people keep a low uh, circulating fluid volume. You're going to have patients that go into renal failure. Now you can have a, something that's an acute situation or a chronic situation. For instance, I know somebody that very recently went in for surgery at an area hospital, should have been an in and out surgery for the day, and they ended up on dialysis and they're on a ventilator. So he had acute kidney failure. It's not chronic kidney failure, he didn't have kidney disease. He had acute kidney failure. So you can imagine a patient that got severely dehydrated for whatever reason, they were outside having heat stroke, they're probably going to have kidney failure associated with that. That's going to be an acute setting versus somebody that has kidney disease where they just are uh, getting worse and worse over time. Acute failure usually results from shock or toxic ingestion. When I say shock, I'm talking about severe hypovolemia, uh, which would be something severely dehydrated. It's where you see this, a lot of blood loss. Or they've taken something that kills the kidneys. Tylenol, for instance. Uh, chronic failure, 
you may have patients that have inherited uh, predisposition to kidney disease. Uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension, that kills the kidneys. You know, what I told you about sugar, it's necrotic, it kills the kidneys. Hypertension kills the kidneys. I have a question. You said okay. Tylenol. Is that NSAID or just Tylenol? Tylenol. So Tylenol has something in there differently than like Advil? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, ma'am. Like you don't want to take Tylenol with alcohol. <coughs> you know, if you're drinking a lot and you want to take that aspirin the next day, take aspirin, don't take Tylenol. Has aspirin component. Yeah, we knew that about you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Complications of renal failure. So if you've got a patient with renal failure, if somebody calls 911 for this patient, these are the things you're going to see. Pulmonary edema. Why is that? Yeah, back of the kidneys. The kidneys can't function. They can't filter the blood. They end up holding potassium and they get overloaded with fluid. Cardiac tamponade, I'm not sure why cardiac tamponade presents with renal failure. Electrolyte, distur electrolyte disturbances, certainly. If you've got electrolyte disturbance, you're looking at cardiac dysrhythmias. Those go hand in hand. In order for the, your cardiac tissue to do all the functions that it does, it, it requires several different electrolytes. Congestive heart failure, uh, that's hand in hand with pulmonary edema. Hypertension, they usually are hypertensive anyway, it just gets worse. Liver failure, uh, seizures, uremia, uremia is going to be a you know, high concentration of uric acid in the, uh, the vascular system. Yeah, so there's a lot of really nasty complications from renal failure. Uh, you need your kidneys to work. Signs and symptoms. Uh, usually pain in the abdomen, the pelvic area. They may have blood in the urine. That's what this word means right here. Urea, that's going to say urine to you. Hema is blood, so you've got blood in the urine. Edema, why do they have decreased urine output? Yeah, kidneys aren't working. It's not going to filter that and squeeze out that urine and have it uh, extricated. It just stays and circulates. Hypertension, anorexia, I guess because they feel like crap. Tachycardia, um, because they have low circulating blood volume, oftentimes. But yeah, these are sick, sick people. Uh, these people are prime for cardiac arrest uh, because of why? What one in here tells you cardiac arrest? Yeah, mainly it's the electrolyte imbalances uh, that cause that. It causes the cardiac dysrhythmias. And you put so much stress on your heart anyway with this. Um, when you think about all that, the toxic materials that are circulating in the bloodstream, those toxic materials are circulating through your heart tissue, through your coronary arteries. So you're killing yourself. It's not uncommon for you to respond to somebody in respiratory distress at a dialysis center and you get there and they are gasping their last breath and they're in cardiac arrest. Pulmonary edema, cardiac dysrhythmias, it's not good. End-stage renal disease, you will see this uh, written out, ESRD, end-stage renal disease. Uh, renal disease doesn't go away, it just gets worse, it can't be fixed. Uh, it's kind of like diabetes, they can give them insulin, they can take medication, but it's a chronic disease that will gradually kill your patient. So these patients, once they're in end stage, they're, this means that they're on dialysis. They're going down there and they're getting dialysis. They will not get better. It's irreversible. And we have two types of dialysis. We've got hemodialysis, which means we are cleaning the blood where you're actually bringing the blood out, they're circulating through a machine to filter it, and then they're putting it back in the patient. Whereas peritoneal dialysis is different. You actually do peritoneal dialysis at home, and they actually inject water or fluid of electrolyte solution also. They circulate through the abdomen, and then they suck it back out. It's not nearly as efficient as hemodialysis, and your patients that aren't quite as sick 
you know, in the early parts of end-stage renal disease, they may be able to do it at home in peritoneal dialysis, but it takes just as much time versus going to uh, a center and getting hemodialysis. 90% receive hemodialysis in specialized centers. You, you don't do that at home. More than uh, 350,000 people in America receive some type of treatment for end-stage renal dialysis. That means uh, they get some type of dialysis, end-stage renal disease, not renal dialysis. Hello. Only 8% treat themselves at home. So it's not nearly as effective, but it's much more comfortable for your patient. They're able to stay in their home. They don't have to be transported to the center. So they prefer to do that, but it's, it probably is uh, a third is, did I put something wrong up there? No, I was like, that's a 2%. 8%, 9 Well, it says better than 90%. I, I don't want to know what the other people do. Some of them just, they probably don't do anything. Yeah, they're probably yeah. the non-compliant. Yeah, of course, there are plenty of those. Uh, these patients rely on us usually to transport them to and from the dialysis center. There are services out there that that's all they do is transport patients back and forth to dialysis centers. Um, most, for the most part, they're fairly uneventful. You just deliver them, but uh, recognize that these patients are very uh, vulnerable to things that we just talked about, and it can happen very quickly once their electrolytes get out of balance. If you've got a patient that's sick, oftentimes when they're sick, they're not feeling well, they say, well, I'm just not gonna go to dialysis today. Well, you're already sick. Missing dialysis is gonna multiply their illness by about 500. So if they were already sick and they choose to stay home, and then by the next day, I mean, their eyes are turning yellow, not really, but they're much, much sicker than they were, and these are the patients oftentimes that will respond to their home, and uh, they're very, very sick. Hemodialysis, they're connected to a machine. I already mentioned that to you. It, it, uh, circulates the blood, cleans the blood, then puts it back in. Uh, they, it takes them several hours, three to five hours in a sitting, and they will go at least three times a week. So it's very regular. If they miss one time, uh, it, it screws them up really bad. Now, some of the things you need to be looking for, uh, in order for them to do hemodialysis, they have to have constant, ready access to the vascular system. So you've got a couple of ways. Here you've got this two-port catheter that is up in the chest that they may access in and out. Some of them may have a fistula uh, underneath the skin. Is that a leg? It's really weird. It's a I never can tell. Well, what's this thing right here? Looks like a butt crack. <laughs> I'm never good with these photos. I can't tell what that is. Is this an armpit? Okay, well, he's not in very good shape. All right, so an AV fistula. So if you saw that on a patient, you want to make sure that you don't do anything with that arm. You don't want to put a blood pressure cup on that arm. Uh, we don't start IVs on that arm. We just kind of stay away from it. We don't want to do anything that could compromise this access that they have. Peritoneal dialysis, as you can see, you know, your picture's not as good as mine here. This is going into the side of the abdomen here. And they will sit just like they would at, at a center, and uh, this fluid is inserted, it circulates, and then they draw it back out. It's a special fluid. It absorbs waste, uh, some of that waste material, and you also end up drawing out more fluid. Patients on dialysis or patients with kidney failure uh, very frequently will have a lot of fluid in the abdomen. It builds up. It's got to go somewhere. The kidneys are not processing it and getting that fluid out. As long as you continue to eat and drink normally, these patients will build up a lot of fluid in their body. So they need to get that out. So peritoneal dialysis does a decent job of getting the fluid out, but it doesn't filter the blood uh, like you, you will have with, uh, with hemodialysis. Let's see, most of your dialysis patients, they've got a lot more things going on than just kidney failure. They are sick in a whole lot of other ways. Very frequently, they're diabetic. Um, they are, have high blood pressure. 
Most of your calls are going to be with a patient that has failed to go keep their appointment at the dialysis center. The signs you're going to see are going to be like congestive heart failure. They're going to have fluid in their lungs. They're going to have pulmonary edema. They're going to have swelling of their ankles. If they're in bed, they're going to have, you know, sacral swelling. Um, you may hear rock iron rails in their lungs. They're extremely tired. They have no wind. Shortness of breath, edema, electrolyte disturbances. That means if the medics come and they put them on a cardiac monitor, they're going to see all sorts of screwy cardiac dysrhythmias. Okay, your patient, what, what's going to be your primary concern with these patients? A, B, C. Regardless of how they got there, our treatment is going to be the same, A, B, C. Once you get them to the hospital, in this case, probably the dialysis center, if they're stable enough, um, if you can get them in time, dialysis can fix them quickly. But if they if they've missed two dialysis appointments, uh, they're pretty well toast. You're going to uh, put them on oxygen because they're not oxygenated well. Uh, they got fluid in the lungs. Monitor them. Have your AED ready. Like I said, these people are prime for cardiac arrest. Now check with the emergency department uh, before you take them to a dialysis center. Most of the time, if they're sick enough that you've had to respond to their home, then they need to go to the emergency department. But from there, they will refer them or manage, they'll get them dialysized somehow. You may sometimes see bleeding from their fistula. That's not uncommon. Uh, they don't want those things to clot off, so they may be on some kind of blood thinner to keep that from clotting off, in which case they will bleed excessively if uh, if they get that compromised, which could happen if you imagine how easy it would be to get that infected, you know, if the patient gets sick. Uh, if it's just by movement, they may disrupt that, uh, that catheter that's in there. So how do we control bleeding from a fistula? Yeah, how do we control bleeding? Yeah, direct pressure. Absolutely, you're gonna put direct pressure and you're gonna continue to do that you're going to put a pressure bandage on there. If it's bleeding excessively, or you're concerned that your patient's going to bleed to death, what do you do? Tourniquet. Yep, you'll consider a tourniquet. So you're going to treat these patients like you would any other patient that's bleeding. You, you don't want to damage that fistula, but gee, if they're about to bleed to death, you're losing that fistula, I'm putting a tourniquet on you. I don't see why not. You know, they may be on some type of blood thinner, but for this, if you can control the bleeding without compromising that fistula, that's always good. But I hadn't thought about that. So watch for cardiac dysrhythmias, respiratory distress, shock, infection. These are sick people, sick, sick people. Peritonitis, what is that? Infection. Yeah, infection of the peritoneal lining, which uh, remember we were talking about the GI stuff. If you've got any compromise to the GI tract and you get some of that material into the abdomen, that stuff is very, uh, it's very irritating and it's going to cause infection in there. So when you're looking at patients on dialysis and they're gathering all that fluid, that fluid in there, and it, in the event they got any blood in their blood is very irritating anywhere in your tissues except in your vascular system. And so they're very frequently will have peritonitis. Treatment, ah, let's see, ABCs, control bleeding, oxygen, treat for shock. Anything new here? No. The important thing is you're not freaked out when you see these patients. You know, when they're bleeding from the fistula, or you pick one up at the dialysis center, take them home, and all of a sudden they start getting respiratory distress, and you hear fluid in their lungs or wheezing, you know right then you're not taking them home, you're turning around and going to the hospital, right? Yeah. Now here, if peritonitis is suspected transport dialysis fluid, we're talking about people that have a peritoneal dialysis in their home. Kidney transplant patients. Kidney is the most transplanted organ. Approximately 16,000 transplants per year. Wow. 
These patients are always going to be on anti-rejection drugs. Uh, they could very easily have issues. They're much more susceptible to infections. Uh, but for the most part, kidney transplant patients remain pretty stable. For the most part. There's so many people on this planet and only that many of you have cancer Per year. That's ridiculous. Are you going to give them your kidney? No, but people will die. You know, a lot of them are sick. You know, when you look at the people that are organ donors, if they've been like hit by a Mack truck, we're not getting any organs there. You know, if they're sick and they're diseased, you're not getting any organs. So you really are just looking for healthy people to die without getting messed up. You know, if they are drug abusers, which, you know, about 80% of the population it seems to be, then those kidneys are probably not going to be any good. Yeah. So we're not taking. Society where every treatment is here, take this, to not be drug Yeah. It can be tough. But anyway. Oh, I have another video. Let's see. If I can do this, I have to do this, right? I'm going to go. Don't want to hear it. I'm getting it, yeah. i got to figure out why this happens. I do soft things from time to time. Kidneys are a pair. Kidneys are a pair of about 12 cm long bean-shaped organs. They lie at level of your waist on the back side of your body. Every human being has two kidneys which lie on the right and left side of the spine. The kidneys produce urine. The urine flows from the kidney through the ureter to the bladder. The bladder passes out the urine through the urethra. Kidneys have three important functions. They filter harmful waste products from the blood and drain them out via urine. They balance the level of fluids and salt in the body. They produce hormones. Chronic kidney disease occurs when there is a change in the structure or function of the kidney. An infection, damage, tumor or side effect of certain medications can cause kidney diseases. A kidney disease often has great implications on health and the functioning of the rest of the body. If you're suffering from a kidney disease, kidney failure can occur. In that case, your kidneys are not able to filter waste products and fluid adequately from your blood and extract them from the body. When the kidneys don't function properly, you might have the following symptoms. Fatigue. Nausea and loss of appetite, skin itching, high blood pressure, difficulty in concentrating, difficulty in sleeping or excessive sleep, shortness of breath. If the kidney functions can't be restored and both kidneys fail, then dialysis is needed. It is necessary if the function of the kidneys is less than 10%. The function of your kidneys will be performed artificially. There are two major types of dialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. In hemodialysis, your blood is filtered through a dialysis machine outside your body. In peritoneal dialysis, a dialytic fluid is flushed through your abdominal cavity, extracting the waste products from your blood. An alternative for dialysis is kidney transplantation. You get a healthy kidney from someone. Your general practitioner can give you more information about the disorder and its possible treatments. Most commonly, 
Middle, Middle Eastern. Eastern and African American, most commonly. Um, why do we call it sickle cell? Is it only African Americans or all dark skin? Generally, saying more dark skin people. Because African Americans kind of limited to that population. So it's going to be on the text. <laughs> <laughs> Book says African Americans yeah. and Middle Eastern populations, which of course, when you look at dark people, it d doesn't include the Hispanics. As far as I know, they don't have any higher incidence of it. But in our population, we're the two largest populations of ours are, are Caucasian and, and African American, I guess. But anyway, um, I did want to mention sludging. Sludging is what happens when those, uh, those cells don't move easily through the vascular system. So if you see sludging, Make sure you know what that means. But it tends to block the, uh, some of the smaller vessels. Kidneys perform uh, a lot of functions for us. They filter waste products, help maintain water balance. It's important. Renal failure, we already talked about that. Other problems with the renal system that we didn't talk about, and your book talks about, is kidney stones in particular. So make sure you read about that, because you will get kidney stone patients. And uh, that can be also quite painful. So I've heard. Dialysis, make sure you understand the dialysis process, uh, the two different forms of dialysis, and how, you know, the different uh, objectives of those, how they operate. Hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Dialysis patients usually are going to go three times a week. And if they miss it, that's when you see them. You always want to find out if your patient has sickle cell disease or if they've got end-stage renal disease. So make sure you ask them about that. Do they have a fistula, an AV fistula? What does that mean, AV? What does it mean? Artery. Yep, ar uh, arterial to venous. Well, I need to make an early request for ALS. If you feel like your patient is unstable, a dialysis patient, probably want to go and call, go ahead and call ALS because they have the propensity to go bad on you very quickly. Okay, you have a patient who's transported routinely for dialysis three times a week. She was sick and she canceled the trip rest yesterday. Now she calls and she says she can't breathe and she feels like she's going to die. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, she's probably going to die. She says she feels like she's going to die. That's usually a good way. Is it possible that she has a legitimate complaint after missing dialysis? My only only this one day. Yes. You bet. That was a nasty picture. Let me put that up there. Oh, gee, how rude. Okay, let me see. 